Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the poster sessions. I see some very active discussions were happening. People almost forgot to eat lunch. Um, we are uh, back with the second half of this retreat, where our first talk is going to be by Dr. Roman Yampolowski. He is uh, an RIT alum. So I'm very uh, happy to introduce him today. He's an associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the Speed School of Engineering, University of Louisville. And he's also the founding director of the Cybersecurity Lab there. His main areas of interest are in AI safety and cybersecurity. And he has authored Artificial Superintelligence, a Futuristic Approach. So that should give you an insight of what the talk is going to be about. Dr. Yampolowski has been recognized as Distinguished Teaching Professor, Professor of the Year, Faculty Favorite, leading in engineer, Leader in Engineering Education, and Outstanding Early Career in Education Award. And he was, I was just asking him, when did you actually graduate from RIT? And it was only in 2004. So that is an, um, quite a bit of accomplishment in a short period of time. And he's also an author of over 100 publications, including multiple journal articles and books. His research has been profiled in popular magazines, such as New Scientist, Science World Magazine, and hundreds of websites. And he was also giving um, TV shows and part of radio shows. Today, he will be presenting to us on the future of artificial intelligence. Dr. Yampolowski. Thank you so much. Uh, you can hear me now. This is awesome. I got four mics. Didn't work out for me. Thank you for inviting me back. It's a great honor being an RIT graduate. I'm happy you're not embarrassed of me. This is, this is a good sign. So uh, very special. I learned a lot from RIT, and hopefully I can bring some knowledge back and share with you. Uh, I'll start my presentation the same way I always do. I tell my students I have a lot of interesting information to share for free with you. So if you like, you can follow me on Twitter, you can follow me on Facebook, but you cannot follow me home. It's very important. <laughs> so make sure that's the case. <laughs> Funny thing, so there is 250 registered for this. Maybe one will actually do it. So lately I've been doing this mixed model where I go, today we're trying reverse psychology. You are not allowed to follow me. <laughs> and that produces better results. So whatever works for you, do that. Um, I love that I'm following lunch. I'm not competing with hungry, hangry people. This is great. Also, we have some amazing speakers in the morning who did a marvelous job of building up my case. It's very hard to convince people to care about super intelligent machines if they don't think we're going to get them. But uh, the first two speakers, just amazing. My first couple of slides are well covered. I'll start by saying something not very controversial. I'll say that artificial intelligence, as we always defined it in the field, is here. We have machines capable of driving us around, transcribing speech, doing some very interesting things, which for many years were considered to be. Are we going to allow me to jump around? You hear me now? Yeah. Just as well. Freedom! All right. Uh, can you see the pictures? The lighting here is uh, for security purposes. It makes the slides <laughs> impossible to see from the window. But uh, between Siri, between all the IBM Watson and such, can we all agree we have artificial intelligence as we did research on it for the last decade or so? I say yes. And now this is OK. Another statement, uh, maybe a little more controversial. Robots are here. We don't have them in this room, but we know how to make them, how to build them. Some places have more of them than others. Uh, bodies are easy. Max kind of mentioned that. We know how to make robot bodies. So interesting questions are what's next? What's happening afterwards? OK, so this is not high enough. Is this better? Sweet. So I'm going to claim that next step is super intelligence, which means intelligence more capable than any human being in any domain. Why do I say that? There is a number of factors which kind of come together and uh, make me conclude that. First of all, levels of funding. We seem to have billion dollar projects from governments, from industry, all pouring money into reverse engineering the brain, understanding how intelligence works. 
We have the most intelligent, most interesting people working on this problem. Whatever is Google, DeepMind, Facebook research in uh, AI, really top researchers are all devoted to that problem. There are now conferences on this topic, books coming out. So it's not completely insane to think we might succeed at some point. How soon is a completely different question. I don't usually make predictions about timing, but it seems like it's going to happen at some point. I'm still going to tell you soon, but just to make it interesting. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is director of engineering at Google, is uh, famous for making those beautiful exponential curves, predicting what's going to happen and how soon. He basically takes computational capacity we have at the point and maps it against things like mouse brain, human brain, and so on. So looking at his predictions, and I guess you can't see any of the text, uh, we're looking at something like 2023, 2045 in terms of getting to human level computational capacity. Now that doesn't guarantee that we have algorithms capable of supporting that performance, but it's a good sign that at least we're not limited by the brain capacity of those machines. I'm not going to say too much about uh, power of supercomputers, quantum computers, how they work, because again, we had those amazing speakers who assured us we're going to have quantum computing very soon. So computational capacity is not going to be a problem. Uh, all I want to point out is where we are today in our place in terms of performance. So we are at that stage where human performance dominates computer performance in most domains. But that's changing more and more for different narrow domains. Things like chess, go, poker. Every week we hear about something no longer being humans are best at. Machines are becoming first as good as humans and very quickly way better. That time where we are the same is almost a nanosecond. So I'll cover different properties of those uh, machines, super intelligent machines, which make me very much interested in researching them more at this early stage. So obviously, by definition, they are super smart. You all seen Jeopardy. You know about recent success with uh, poker. Yes, you heard. Humans are no longer the best at playing poker. Uh, Provost uh, spoke about specifically game of go, moves 78 and 37. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of the game covering that, but uh, something I want to point out. So move 78 was this great comeback for humanity, supposedly. <laughs> if you look at move 37, later on it spells out die humans at the end. That's, that's what happens there. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is, uh, last month I had a chance to speak to creators of AlphaGo. And the system is still training. It's still running. It's still playing against itself. It's getting better every day. It defeated 50 top players last month in this game. There are no humans who are competitive against it today. And never will be again. Lisa Dole can practice. He's, I'm sure, the best Go player. But he will never be twice as good as he is today. AlphaGo will be. It is important to understand that, again, that point where computers caught up to us and stay at a human level, it's the tiniest of points. As soon as we learn how to get to human level, we go beyond that. That move 78, that one game, humanity won, AI lost, that was exactly that nanosecond we got. It was awesome. And we can learn a lot from machines to improve our game, to become better. But we are no longer competitive in that domain. What are the features which make computers so dominant? Well, speed, of course. We know about standard speed. Computers are faster. They do millions of operations per second. But think about their impact in the world. They are super fast. They are capable of ultra fast extreme events. They can crash stock market and bring it back, and you won't even notice it happened. Trillions of dollars of wealth disappear, show up again. You won't even know what's happening. Complexity of machines. We are at the point where we can no longer take control back. No human can control modern systems responsible for, let's say, nuclear power plants. They're just too complex. So there is no undo button in the sense of, uh, let's, let's see what uh, we can do with just humans in charge. This is what I refer to the super controlling properties of those machines. A lot of times we talk about, 
well, it might be dangerous to put machines in charge. If we give them control in the future, they might do things to us. We gave them control years ago. They are controlling on every aspect of our life. Stock market is like 85% automated trading. It's happening more and more. Uh, power grids, power plants, military, all of it is controlled by software. Now, depending on your definitions of AI and super intelligence, we can argue about how intelligent that software is. But the point is, the amount of control is only increasing. And because of complexity, we cannot undo it. As a cybersecurity researcher, I have a lot of interest in understanding how AI and security interact. If you look at trends in computer viruses, in terms of increase in number of computers impacted, amount of damage caused, we see sort of exponential curve already. But what happens when we have human level intelligence paired up with viruses? The weakest point, as every security expert knows, is the human, social engineering attacks. Pretty much any attack becomes possible with that combination. And of course, we all know that the biggest funder of uh, AI research is the military. They have some good projects, rescue robotics, but we also very much have interest in creating killer robots, soldier robots, automated drones. So those are all different properties of this technology which uh, make me somewhat concerned about it. I'm not going to tell you that there is no amazing benefit to be gained from AI. It would be wrong. There is. And we can't even understand just how much good can be done with this technology for science, for health, for uh, economy. We have free labor, physical, cognitive. We can pretty much do anything we, we can dream about. In fact, some things are so outside of our understanding, there will be good things we can't even know, unknown unknowns. That's pretty much the last positive slide I'm going to have. <laughs> because everyone else will always tell you about all the awesome benefits of AI. It seems to be somewhat biased coverage. I want to make you at least think about what are other alternatives. Same technology, but what if it's used in a different way? So negative impacts. Again, say economy. Same exact thing. Free labor. What happens to all the people who lose their jobs, and I mean all the people. I don't mean just the guy giving you a ticket in the parking. What happens uh, in terms of politics? That might be an improvement. I need to update that slide. But everything else, and again, the, s the small sub-slide I'm concerned about is the unknown unknowns. A system which is smarter than me can come up with really big problems I didn't even consider. So that's why I'm very concerned about it. I'm not alone. For a long time, I was alone, and nobody really cared about what I had to say until those famous people said the same thing. And now everyone invites me to give keynotes. It is nice. Uh, some of them are not experts in AI research, but they are scientists, entrepreneurs, politicians. And they all had expressed at least some level of concern in terms of what really advanced artificial intelligence can bring us. Uh, people like Elon Musk are concerned enough to actually start funding research. So I got some of that sweet Elon Musk money for that. But uh, more and more, we're starting to see others get involved in this research. And I talk about how much exponential growth we saw in research in this area recently. So what of oh, slides is so, wow. The colors are not even close. OK. so. What makes it a problem? Like, why is this something to worry about? I'll give a few examples, and I'll leave time for questions to really bring it home. But uh, let's look around us. So you guys did a great job with diversity. You have a really diverse crowd here, different cultures, religions, genders, you name it. But if you think about our brains, how they are made, designed, the values we have, we are all part of this tiny little blue dot right here. That's the universe of possible minds things which can optimization powers, can have optimization powers over certain problems. And their preferences, their values, they don't have to have anything to do with us whatsoever. So that's a really mind-blowing statement, right? Like, you always think that everyone would want a big house and a boat. Like, an AI would so go for that. But reality is, no, it's not the case at all. And if we don't specifically control for 
what values we instill in those systems and just randomly do it or evolve them to succeed at any cost, they'll end up somewhere else in that space. And that space, most of the time, is not compatible with human flourishing. So I call it the singularity paradox problem. You have super intelligent systems. They are capable of optimizing for solutions in all domains, but they have no common sense. Things a five-year-old would know, they don't know them. And that creates really significant problems. I can give you countless examples of very trivial situations where a machine would get it horribly wrong, and I'll talk about how AIs fail closer to the end. So what do I do in my research? A, I'm trying to understand what the problem domain is. It helps to figure out how AIs can fail us. What is the pathway to a dangerous machine? A lot of people talk about kind of standard engineering problems. We fail to design machine properly. We fail to implement the design properly. Maybe the data was biased. So all those are significant issues, no doubt about it. And a lot of them are unsolved. Lately, I've become more and more concerned with a problem I call malevolent design or purposeful malevolence. And that's basically a situation where you have bad actors using good software on purpose. So we heard Max give example of uh, drone collision avoidance software, which with a flip of a sign became drone destruction and <laughs> military happiness software. And that's just one example. You buy software out of a box, but what you do with it is up to you. And you're all very ethical researchers, nice people, but there are crazy people out there. Are we having? It's me. It's not the mic. Thank you. So we actually have a workshop coming up at Oxford on bad actors in AI. And I'm not talking about Schwarzenegger. Like, <laughs> what are the possible types of people who can misuse this technology? And the scary thing is, the answer sh seems to be everyone. Even if you don't know how to program, if you get kind of access to a nice GUI, you can do a lot of damage with technology we have today. As technology improves, the situation only gets worse. You have insider threat. You have all sorts of problems with it. And almost no one is looking at actually addressing this problem. So recently, to my delight, some people started working on this problem, publishing books. Uh, many of you probably seen Bostrom's book, Superintelligence. Uh, there are other books on superintelligence I highly recommend. Uh, the good news is it's no longer just a positive work like Kurzweil would always talk about infinite lifespans, free money and all, but people actually start to consider, well, you have a system smarter than us with no controls. Is that smart? <laughs> the response in the last two, three years was truly amazing. It went from, okay, a few people with blogs doing science fiction to now centers with multi-million dollar budgets going up at all the top universities. Oxford, Cambridge, Berkeley, MIT, University of Louisville, they all now have people working on this problem. Uh, you maybe heard there was a conference in Asilomar uh, earlier this year, brought about 100 people, top AI researchers, all interested in addressing this problem, solving this problem. So it is a great time to, to consider this area of research at the intersection of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. To, to help people jump into that area, uh, one of the first things I did with a colleague of mine was to survey the state of the art in this field. So what have people done? What has been actually considered as a possible solution for controlling intelligent machines? And surprisingly, a lot. Uh, we have a paper. It's uh, open access. You can get it for free. You don't have to buy my book. Um, we surveyed about 300 different references. We try to be very comprehensive, classify them, analyze them. Uh, the interesting part is, look at the dates. So some of the earliest work we found was from 1863. <laughs> so it's been in the back of our minds for a while. But interestingly, uh, with a lot of interest, there are still very few actual solutions. So it's not like it's a solved problem. And uh, I want to give you kind of flavor of what people have proposed in terms of uh, solutions. Not necessarily the best solutions. I cannot survey all 300 of them. I have a few minutes. 
But I'll give you kind of highlights of most common, most popular ones, and then we can have some question answers about. So one solution people suggest is do nothing. I don't like this solution for a number of reasons. One, it's very hard to get funding for it. <laughs> Two, uh, basically the logic is we're not going to succeed at building super intelligent machines. It's never going to happen. And if it happens, they're going to be super nice to us because smart people are nice. I am not convinced. Another idea, anyone knows who that is? Yeah. Professor Kaczynski? <laughs> yeah. Uh, his publisher emailed me a few weeks ago. He's like, uh, do you want to get a copy of his latest book? And I'm like, OK, I'll review it, sure, whatever. And a package comes from Unabomber. <laughs> and I'm like, I ordered it, but do I open it? <laughs> it was interesting. So his idea was a solution I really don't like. It was to kill computer scientists. As a computer scientist, I'm against it. But <laughs> he had good writing points. Uh, people recommend things like integration with society. We can tell robots to follow our legal system because it works so well and makes perfect <laughs> sense for machines to be sent to prison and such. So there are people writing about it, but I'm not convinced as well. Uh, this is an interesting one. So we talk about competing with machines, but we are not very capable. We don't have perfect memories. We're not super fast. What if we can update our brains? Either uploading them to software somehow, or having what uh, Elon Musk uh, lately been trying to sell is this neural lace idea, human brain interface, which gives you the powers machine has and makes you more competitive. You get all the benefits of a human with all the power of a machine. Two problems with that. I'm not sure you still become, uh, remain a human if you become a piece of software. Sounds like you become part of a problem to me. And two, in that uh, human machine hybrid, it seems like you have a bottleneck. You contribute very little, and you will be removed very soon. We'll see how it goes. Uh, probably the most famous solution, three laws of robotics. How many of you heard of Asimov's laws? That's the worst solution ever. Like, <laughs> if you learn anything from this talk, that's not a solution. It's a literary tool to write really interesting books, and it's designed to fail every single time. They are self-contradictory. They're ill-defined. They just don't work. And increasing the number of laws to 10 or anything like that still doesn't work. So just put it out there. Some of the projects I'm interested in. So this idea of formal verification, we had it for software for a very long time. But uh, there is really no idea how to do it for intelligent software in novel domains. How do you verify behavior of an agent, independent agent, capable of agent in a environment you are not controlling ahead of time. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Is it even possible? How to do it? And uh, there are some research grants available in this domain. Another uh, kind of subdomain of solutions I'm looking at is containment. So if you study computer viruses, you would put them in an isolated computer, air gap it from the internet, try to get as much information as you can from, from that machine, see what uh, that, that virus. Try to analyze it, figure out who wrote it, how it works. So we propose something similar for intelligent systems so you can study them safely, limit access to data they can learn from, limit output they can use for social engineering attacks. Uh, we got some initial funding for this work, so that's one of the projects I'm working on right now. So I'm getting closer to kind of a question answer portion of this. I want to give you a few big level ideas, and they could be controversial or not. Uh, one thing I want to say is we as scientists accepted the idea that unethical research exists. Some things are just not a good idea to work on, like biological weapons, for example, or nuclear weapons, experimenting on humans. Those, seems, uh, those things seem to be uh, outside of what we as scientists are interested in doing. Uh, we've seen with uh, uh, artificial biology, synthetic biology, we put moratoriums on human cloning for a few years because we feel like it's a good idea to do that. We just don't know how to safely create a human clone. We don't want to mess up somebody's life. In universities, uh, it, it's common to employ ethical review boards, especially in medical research, 
to make sure that whatever it is you're proposing to do meets some sort of standards. Then I propose doing same thing for AI research. It sounded weird. We're just doing software. Who's going to get hurt? Uh, since then, companies like Google DeepMind, uh, Lucid AI, and some others started AI ethics boards. I was part of a committee for a major engineering organization, uh, AAAI, and we got uh, just uh, last month uh, first version of ethical guidelines for superintelligence released telling all the engineers in the world what not to do and what to try to do. So it seems like this general idea of considering at least that intelligence can be dangerous and we need to think twice before just releasing it or developing it is uh, gaining ground. Personally, I never want to ban research. That's not a good idea. So I'm trying to understand if we can separate the two kinds of research. Narrow AI research, where you're working in a specific domain, you're making great progress, but there is no chance your software will ever learn anything outside of that domain. If you're doing pattern recognition, addresses and envelopes, that's great. You're increasing your accuracy. Uh, it's awesome. If there is a chance that your software is capable of self-improving, capable of writing next level of software, capable of transferring knowledge between different domains, and uh, really has no limits to where it's going very quickly, maybe you should slow down and ask yourself, do I have a safety mechanism for this? Can I control it? This is equivalent to first designing a car, putting it on a highway, and as you're going 85, going, did we make a break for it? So again, uh, it's probably hard to see, but I put together a timeline of different AI failures over the years. And you probably can see details, but there is an exponential pattern to it. As we get more successful at building AI systems, whatever it is they do, whatever domain they work in, they fail. If it's a go-playing software, it will lose a game, it lost a game. If it's a self-driving car, it will kill someone, it will have an accident. Uh, you all have autocorrect. You know what that does. So the pattern is pretty obvious. As we give more power and more responsibility to those systems, they will fail at a higher rate and with more damage. And very few people even care about introducing a safety mechanism in place. So kind of as advice for IT in terms of what you guys can really do to put yourself as number one in the world. Uh, take advantage of your cybersecurity expertise. Very few people are doing that right now. It's hard to compete in pure AI. Between Google, Facebook, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, there is a lot of players in that game. But there are very few players in AI safety. In the next five, 10 years, that's going to change. Uh, all those companies are hiring right now, specifically in that domain. I think uh, Google DeepMind team is now up to four AI safety researchers. And they just started this year. So if you want to analyze those specific failures, we can look at the papers, talk about details. Um, I mentioned my book a few times. You don't have to buy it. My publisher is charging way too much. All the papers are available for free. Get them on my website, Google Scholar. All works beautifully. Uh, if you want to buy it, people on Amazon like it. It's a great book. I will leave lots of room for questions and answers to the best of my ability. Thank you for that stimulating talk. Uh, now the floor is open for the audience to ask questions. And I start by saying, read the survey paper with 300 ideas. You're proposing chaining AIs. It's been suggested. It makes the problem worse. You have multiple levels of control instead of one level. So now you can fail at some, some additional level in communication. So it, it's unlikely to work. If you can't control one AI, you're not going to control multiple AIs of different level of capacity. Did that yeah. answer it? Good question. Formulation that's 
strategy and tactics to accomplish the goal? And following that, uh, what do you think about the introduction of biased information to have something develop a um, purposefully non-optimal strategy, such as uh, a kind of cloak and dagger uh, approach that fools kind of fit into thinking something that's obviously not true? So your second question sounds like it's looking at adversarial data that's uh, been pretty hot area in neural networks. We discovered that we can train another neural network to fool the first one, and the fake images or movies or whatever we send in look very realistic even to humans. So yeah, that's the hottest area right now. Like, if you're doing adversarial neural networks, you're good. Well, I do with my Amazon wish list. Uh, well, I have a small game I try to play where I just buy um, products for my ex-girlfriend and then see how I can fool the advertising tracker in deciding what my gender or age was as a result. But that was kind of silly, and now I get really weird products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's kind of uh, I sympathize. Uh, <laughs> the interesting area with those adversarial images and such is we are a neural network. What is the equivalent for humans and how you can use them? Uh, it seems to be there are some possibilities to cause epileptic seizures or things of that nature just by showing you something. Yeah. Your first question, I think, was uh, kind of telling between narrow AI and general AI, and it's not easy to do because oh, it's just a neural network quickly becomes it's a neural network for designing neural networks. So it's an open problem. I don't have a clear solution. Okay. Uh, just one yeah? Yes, sir. So uh, I guess what, at what point do you view AI as an existential threat? Because even if we have a pessimistic view that AI isn't going to get any better than it is today, like we can still wipe out a lot of employment you know, with what we have. I don't see employment as an existential threat. It's an inconvenience. We can solve it politically with unconditional basic income and other welfare-like policies. I'm more concerned about military, militarized AI, weaponized AI. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So there are no solutions. If someone tells you there is a solution to this problem, they are lying to you. No one has a solution. There is a ways to buy us some more time. So Delay. Uh, it, it seems to make sense to review what you're doing before you do it, and if you did it, to be able to safely experiment on it. They will fail. If you read the actual papers and AI boxing and all that, it's a guarantee to fail after amount of time just because of how capable it is in social engineering attacks. And we've seen humans design ways to bypass air gap computers, and it won't be surprising. Um, Self-regulation is not a bad thing. You can have external regulation. My hope is that people who are really capable enough to design an AGI are also smart enough to realize the issue and self-control. Based on who's funding those efforts and coming to those conferences, it seems like top people and like deep mind are in agreement with that, which is a good sign. But they have conflicts of interest, obviously. Tell me when time is out. One more question. I think there is like 10 more. <laughs> yes, sir.
Right, so it's a great question. There is some uh, effort to create FDA for algorithms. Uh, examples we saw with biased algorithms in criminal justice system and things like that before you deploy them, somebody has to check that they are not ridiculously racist. Um, government did put out guidelines for things like self-driving cars and some startups actually shut down because they couldn't meet those requirements. I think what Tesla did, they basically said, if somebody dies, it's gonna cost us $10 million in a lawsuit. We're getting a million miles an hour in data. It's a cheap purchase of data set. Let's, let's do it. Objectively, that's what they did. Google said, no, we have to take it slow and get it right. So it seems like there are different ways to see this problem and to get there. As far as the international component of it, uh, it seems like there is only a few big players capable of this type of work. I'm not concerned about like North Korea developing super intelligence unit computers for that. So, you know what I mean? It, it could happen and then uh, we need to figure out uh, whose values we want AI to have, North Korea and ours. Um, I think we can continue this discussion so offline because it's a nice time to segue into the discussion, focus group discussions. Thank you, Dr. Yampolowski. <laughs> Actually, we have one more thing. Oh, yeah. So do you have your tickets on? I have mine. <laughs> Does that mean I can't? Oh. Okay. We'll see. You, we'll you see. pick yours. You if pick I pick yours. mine. Oh, my God, it's mine. <laughs> I always hack the raffle. <laughs> zero one zero two zero three. Oh, that's interesting. That's not real. It can't be real. Yes, yes. Can you? Awesome. Oh, one or two. Yeah. Yay! Is that that's a cool number. Yeah. And you got lucky with it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I probably should.